Do the trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestseller is all they're cracked up to be. Here at Terrible Book Club, we explore whether you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. You ever passed a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Hello, and you are not welcome to 170, to episode 170 <laughs> of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Chris, and this is Paris. Uh, hello, C- Chris. Do you need, <laughs> do you need a little, little time? No. Let's just get right into this, because this time we read Interview with the Devil, Part 1, Victor's Account, by Skylar Darren. There's a lot of R's in that name. There's four. That's, a, that's the most R's I've ever seen in a name. Skylar. Skylar with two R's. We stumbled upon this on Reddit, where Redditor U slash Lydiard Bell. Lydiard Bell. Yep. <laughs> Do you ever look at a username <laughs> on the internet and you spend like a good 30 seconds trying to figure out what words it's connecting because there's no spacing or anything like that? Yeah, parsing parsing things visually is tough sometimes. But yeah, thanks... Uh, Lydiard Bell. Yeah, that's what we're going with. Mm-hmm. It could be Lydia R. De Bell. That's true. Anyway, that person explained <laughs> that the author had threatened to burn their house down for a review they gave. Charming and uh, a bit disconcerting. For the yeah. The fact that we're about to review this. Yeah, I just want to uh, shout out that Redditor. Thank you for your post. Um, I came upon their post on a thread where you know every once in a while someone in like our books or or reading or i forget or literature is like what's the worst book you've read and every time there's kind of you know the usual so i tend to just take a quick look and see if anything pops out to me as unique and this one did because there was a description about how the author uh was soliciting people for reviews you know because sometimes it's like oh i'll pay you some money for a review or whatever and um, I don't even think money was involved. He was just like, oh, I just want an honest review. He apparently was really uh, um, <laughs> specific that he was looking for honest reviews. And he, he wasn't asking for people to, you know, shine a light up his ass or whatever. I, that's not the right phrase. You know what I mean? Um, and so this user reviewed the book and it was atrocious and gave an honest review. And the author was like, I'm going to find you and burn your house down. And he was serious. And there was a little bit of a back and forth. I guess though that the author has since sort of receded. I don't know. I'm not sure if they're still around, but um anyway, what a great read. We'll find line. out. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we'll find out in a few in a few weeks. Um or month. Anyway, thanks thanks Reddit. Sometimes you're cool. If this is the first time you are listening to Terrible Book Club, what we do here on this show is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, or some other thing, sometimes a combination of the three. Uh, Sometimes we read books that our friends, listeners, or patrons recommend, uh, and sometimes, like today, we just find a book out in the wild, just find it out there, and we decide we're going to read this thing. That's what happened today. Uh, So typically, we do the opposite. We're out here book hunting. (laughs) We're going to find us a real bad one. Uh, So we are, uh, yeah, typically we're, we're doing the opposite of what most people do. Most people are trying to read for pleasure. They're trying to find things they like. We actively seek out things that we think we will dislike. And, you know, most of the time we're right. And it's a hilarious and terrible read. But sometimes we are wrong. We end up liking or even loving the book. So it's it's fun no matter what the outcome. Right, Chris? Yeah. Anyway, we also give out content warnings usually. And boy, oh, boy, you want to pay attention here, fellas. Ladies. Ladies. In addition to our usual barnyard language, today's episode includes discussion or mention of violent murder and sexual assault, but more in sort of a hokey death metal fashion and not in a serious look or examination of it. Although it does get pretty intense. Yeah, I mean, even though all the things that happen in this book are 
laughably stupid they do have a level of uh i don't know a a level of like let's say badness (laughs) that kind of goes beyond what we normally uh discuss and i will say right up front specifically we're gonna we're there is gonna be talk about necrophilia pedophilia and sometimes both at the same time cool (sighs) awesome yeah great Glad I have my voice on an episode where we talk about that. Well, I mean, you know, we're not praising it. <laughs> Let's yeah, just say that. Here we are. Not into it, but we got to talk about it because it's in the book. All right. I am going to go ahead and read the back of the book summary. Today, I actually have a physical copy of the book. So I am holding this thing in my hand, most unfortunately. Like poison. I'm gonna, yeah, it is poison. I'm going to read the back. And, you know, usually a back of the book summary is what the publisher, you know, is is trying to, like, lure you in with. All right. So listen to this and let's see how lured in you feel. <laughs> there sat a frail, abnormally pallid African-American man. His weight looked rather questionable. He looked as if he hadn't eaten in months, judging by the fact that his integral skeleton had been visible through his diminished skin. He stared at me with no facial expression. He just sat there, staring. Satan, the brooding scriptural ghoul that takes on the responsibility for murder, perversion, and the gruesome deaths of children. Society views these horrors as a grim nightmare, a nightmare in which one would desperately attempt to wake up from. But in reality, you simply just can't wake up from a nightmare, for both reality and fiction have become one. Victor, a timid young college student, dreadfully awakens into such a dormonic ordeal from the repulsive dismiss of his relatives to macabre dreams and morbid occurrences. Do not look at Interview with the Devil Part 1 as a mere book, but instead a detour into your own self-morality. Skylar Darren is an artist who specializes what? in painting artwork with metaphorical meaning, including serene landscapes as well as shock art. After graduating from high school at the age of 16, he began working on a new idea, thus the creation of Interview with the Devil. Skylar is currently majoring in psychology in his place of residence in Las Vegas, Nevada. When you say that you excel or specialize in paintings with metaphorical meaning, isn't that most paintings? <laughs> Yeah, you got it, Chris. Ding, ding, ding. You won. You won the prize. Um, yeah, most. That's like most... saying I make music with sound. Th- yeah, that makes you feel a way. Yeah, most paintings uh, do have meaning beyond just color pretty and shape nice. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's some art that is just color pretty, shape nice. But yeah, the vast majority of it's got Even some color else... pretty, shape nice has metaphorical meaning in my view. <laughs> That's true. So, and and I know, listeners, you couldn't hear this, but some of these sentences either had no punctuation or too much punctuation, just like four M dashes for no reason. You know, it, it it's a mess. It's a mess. M dash sounds like a Mega Man power up. I should use those more. M dash. Um, <laughs> all right. So, uh, Chris, you want to take us through our characters and setting and then our summary sure. before, before we get along to to the content? So the setting is just, uh, at first it's in a prison cell, but then it's just the main character's life in America. Do you remember what cities it was in? Well, he says later in the book that he's in the state of El Paso, Texas, which in my mind just meant that the the secession had happened and then Texas (laughs) became... but just El Paso. No, no. You see, Texas seceded and then seceded from itself into multiple fractured (laughs) city-states. Yes, that makes the most sense, actually, for Texas secession. That's what happened in my brain. So the state of El Paso, Texas is the only reference. Maybe it was Nevada at first. Uh, I think it says somewhere. It doesn't matter, though. So why don't you just continue? you talk it's dry really it's just dry <laughs> outside is really all you guys got to worry about anyway our characters are victor who is the main character in the way that he's recounting things that have happened to him before mm-hmm. the violent serial killer guy that is in the first chapter of the book in a jail cell that victor has come to visit and that's pretty much it everyone in victor's family that dies horribly pretty much he covers the whole gamut he makes sure he (laughs) runs through the whole genealogy my mom my dad my mom's mom my mom's dad my dad's mom my mom's dad my stepdad the dog that one time my family just every possible live like Uh, previously living relative and um normally we like to give you a little plot summary so you know General, you know, the general story beats, kind of like the rising action, you know, the important parts. But today, today we've got 
we've got four sentences for you today, Chris. Why don't you shake it away? Sure. Here's our summary so you know what the basic idea of what is going on in here is. Victor is a psychology student who's visiting a depraved serial killer in prison. We detour into how pretty much everyone in Victor's life dies horribly. Most people in this story are either necrophiliacs, pedophiles, or both, and we never even get the interview mentioned in the title. That's it! <laughs> yep. Real good. All right. Uh, so at this point in the show, we usually like to talk about things that were good, uh, but I have nothing for today. Chris, do you have anything good about this book? Was there anything you liked about it? Any redeeming quantity? Could you shine a shit in this book? <laughs> it The one we have is a physical copy that we can destroy, and that might feel good. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I will say, I don't know, not that this is like a defining characteristic of of writing or the book but it was it was short enough i didn't have to waste too much of my life reading this it took me what an hour yes or something. that is an incredible bonus yeah very short it's about all i got there's there was nothing good about this all right well oh, yeah let's get right to it the then. entire rest of the show is going to be things that were bad we are you know we man it's really tough because i feel like now we've had two episodes like this in such quick succession because a couple of months ago, you would have heard our episode about splattering it endearing. And I, I, God, I just feel like we're in the same neighborhood. I feel like this book it's is next door. It's so splattering funny it. that these are two books that are next to each other in this way. Because I also agree with you that it's been rough the past month or so, couple of months. We had sort of a mild break with the, the things that we read before this. But it, it, even then, but the fact that these two are so close comparatively is odd to me because what this one is extremely violent and depraved and splattering yet endearing while also having a little bit of violence in it i mean it was depraved is, in a different way it was violent yes, and depraved in I, a different <laughs> way like and and just to be clear uh for people who maybe don't listen to the show all the time just so you know we're not we're not like asking for censorship of violence or or <laughs> difficult topics <laughs> We're 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 talking about how we don't like when I'm in a death metal band actually. Yeah, and so... I'm I'm in a doom metal band. Whatever, I you know we listen to heavy metal. We we you know I we enjoy some horror content, which we'll talk about a little later. Um, it's more that we don't we think the treatment of those topics is done so poorly that it it renders the work unusable. <laughs> I guess is what is what we're getting at here. So, yeah, nothing good about this. Um. Things that were bad. Okay, let's talk about just... We're going to start. <laughs> I don't know, Chris. Do you want to... Yeah, let's start with this. We're going to start with the one of the big problems in this book. There are two main ones. And the first one is just its general plot content. So, like, the meat of this book is just rancid. Um, on page eight... <laughs> page eight, we've got... We've got talk of skull fucking someone through an eye socket um page eight and it's not done it's real quick yeah just real quick. There real quick and then eight pages later by page like 16 or 20 or something you've got the uh the main character's dad's friend's wife literally mutilating children and forcing him to eat them like and and so, okay, you might be saying, like, wow, that's some really dark shit. However, all of this stuff is listed out like it's the 9 o'clock news. And you're like, <laughs> today in El Paso, in the state of El Paso, Texas, after the secession, a woman cut up her child and fed him to, fed him to a nearby person. And, you know, I don't know. Now let's go to the weather. Like, it's all just real. We're just telling you about. Hi, Tara. I'm David with the weather. <laughs> and I've just pooped my pants live on air. The pant, the poop is running down my leg and onto the studio floor. Also, it's going to be raining all the time. Not only raining, but blood and tears. Not even rain, but tears will be falling from the heavens. Oh. Also, your dog is dead. Oh, thanks, David. Uh, all right. Well, um, I, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really just we're just listing out as many horrible things in the shortest amount of time as we can. So it doesn't even have the impact of grossing you out. It's just stupid. Like it doesn't achieve <laughs> it doesn't achieve the effect of horror because no matter how horrible something is, if you're just like, oh yeah, and then the cat puked and then the pigeon ate its puke and then the cat bit the pigeon and then like a lion ate the cat and the pigeon and then someone ripped the lion's head off. It just it doesn't 
you're not showing me anything. You're not. I don't have any investment. And then the head of the lion <laughs> turned into a horrible zombie yes. that bit my mom. And then my mom turned to me and said, I've never been proud of you before. <laughs> and she took my Pokemon cards <laughs> away from me. And the first half she sold for less than they were worth <laughs> in front of me. And the second half she just threw at me like it was a game of 52 pickup until I was cut up all over my body <laughs> by the Pokemon cards that are now worthless. And now I have dreams about, you know... I don't know, marrying Pikachu and then Pikachu has 90 babies. And, you know, it's really that's the style we've got going on here. And interwoven with this, we've talked about this before, where in uh, some books, you notice the author just gets really stuck on a certain type of bad thing or a certain type of horror or a certain type of death, like manner of death. This book suffers from that, too. Everyone's got intestine stuff going on. Everyone's intestines are getting strewn everywhere. Their innards are out and cut open. And then the other thing is every other person's necrophiliac or a pedophile. Like, seriously, every other character is into dead people or dead kids. (laughs) And it's just... All I can do is laugh because it's not... It it doesn't take itself seriously, and it, but it's not funny, and you can tell that this person isn't trying to be funny or silly. They think that, like, the writing makes it seem as though they think this is actually a serious, scary horror book. All right, I'm going to, you know what, <clears throat> just so we all know, I know we gave you a, a quote-unquote summary where we just said it, it was bad, it had these things. I'm going to read you a list of all the shit that happens in this book because... How about we trade off on this one? <laughs> How about just you and I back and forth thing, just sort of doing our best to present this. By the way, I'm queuing up the big band music and womp womp trombones all over this, guys, because it's it does feel silly pretty quickly. Hello and welcome to the 9 o'clock news. Today we got a kid who got a, a lobster fork through the eye and then someone fucked that eye socket. Chris, what do you got in weather? Uh, Victor's dad, I guess I know Victor, but his dad's friend's wife tortured him and then a child and makes him eat parts of the child while she masturbated. Back to you. Oh, great. Uh, you know what? I just heard that Vic's grandma murdered her husband and masturbated while hanging out with a corpse. What did you hear about, Grandma? Well, Grandma has dreams of being raped by Satan. When she told me about these dreams that she was having, she told me she also hid a knife in her vagina. And then she committed suicide with the vagina knife, and her her entrails are now spelling the nickname of her husband. Wow, great. You know what? And you know what's even worse is her 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 daughter, uh, you know, Vic's mom and mom and then Vic's dad, they were actually attacked by a random assailant. And Vic's mom was pregnant at the time, and the assailant cut her stomach open and took the baby. What did you hear about dad? Why? Well, dad, bad dad well, stuff I... happened too, right? <laughs> God, this, this is getting really insane already. I don't know if I can keep the weatherman bit up here. <laughs> but anyway, dad was masturbating to the dead mom photos, possibly the dead grandma photos too. I don't know who's telling us all these details. Yeah, I don't, I, you know, I'm really surprised that the medical examiner and the police just let people have photos of their deceased relatives in horrible states of mutilation and disintegration. But anyway. After the dad was doing that, he jumped off a bridge onto a freeway, which also led to a bunch of school bus chil- <laughs> led to a bunch of children dying because they were in a school bus, and I don't know, his body hit the school bus or something. Really hard. <laughs> yeah, and really that's hard. Why it's newsworthy, in fact, and then why I'm talking about it on the weather because then, like, all his entrails, as we talked. No, about you're before, right. There were bits just of went all over everywhere. Bits so of flesh. That's my. Yeah, it rained flesh, according to the book. It rained. That's flesh. my area. It's, anyway, it's raining flesh. It's rain and flesh. flesh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, Vic also came to me, the weatherman, here in the studio, and let me know that he had a dream where a neighbor was murdering his wife on the lawn while they're having a funeral next door, and also there was a mutilated dog on the steps of his house that his grandfather then murdered and then a bunch of corpses and satan talk at the dream funeral too and i was like vic you really don't gotta tell me that i'm at work no he's always having bad dreams that he told me about another dream he had where his dead dad and his dead mom were having sex with their dead baby that's really unnecessary and i feel like that's grounds for some kind of harassment suit anyway he also told me that his psychiatrist is actually an evil rapist who escaped prison and isn't even a doctor who roofied his grandmother so his gang can rape and murder her. Yeah, yeah. There was also, I think there was also some racism in there uh, as well. So, you know, take that with what you will. Uh, then he told me that he moved after all that happened. 
And his new neighbors accidentally killed their baby, so they then they just let their six-year-old use it as a doll. But she gets an infection from carrying around the corpse, and then they try to fix the infection by removing her kidney, but they accidentally kill her. And then it turns out the first baby's corpse was no longer viable, so they just like killed another r- random baby to replace the first one. Wow. That's <laughs> quite the story there. <laughs> Anyway, it's not over because he also told me that his grandfather got leprosy and also wasn't a human based on DNA tests that the morgue did for reasons. But then the torso was also just chilling in a gutter on Vic Street for a while. Also, a guy wore the skin from that torso like a coat in the sewers and also has his grandfather's bank account in for, for some reason. And Vic, I was like, I gotta go. It's like really, I I have to tell people that it's raining flesh outside. <laughs> and so, all right. So obviously, all that shit's horrible. Vic decides I'm done living in this in my grandparents' house. So he sells. I his, see we're dropping the bit. Thank God. He sells his grandparents' house to a guy named Grant, who takes on a roommate. Turns out that roommate is a violent pedophile, and some dads find out where he lives, but actually they accidentally murder Grant in a case of vigilantism and mistaken identity. And then the actual rapist roommate gets his dick run over by a train. Okay, to wrap it all up, (laughs) the house ends up being a pedo church or something where they're sacrificing children to the scarecrow of that rapist roommate that we mentioned, and also ripping off their faces. A bunch of neighbors find out and rip the dick skin off the pedophiles, and then one last necrophilia pedo scene just because. Yep. So, great. That's it. Cool. You Glad might have... I got to say that all out loud. <laughs> you might have noticed that in this list of, you know, heinous shit that the author thought about, there's no interview with anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so... The plot. He's there to to give the interview, to ask the questions, and it's all just him talking. I feel like the end of the book should be the serial killer at the other end being like, "I I just asked you where you were from. Dude. Yeah. What the hell? I mean, that's really what happens. Like the first chapter, it's literally a couple pages, is him having a very brief interaction with the serial killer guy, and then he just launches into his backstory, and that's the whole book. So you never get the interview. Why call your book "Interview with the Devil"? When you don't have an interview with anyone and it's not like it's a clever title that you're supposed to figure out because he's so smart. <laughs> like, no, clearly, I, I think he just once again, you have somebody splitting up their book into two just to sell double books, you know. Um, so he did write a part two to this book that came out in 2018. Oh, good. But we did not read that. So, you know, who knows? Maybe the interview didn't even happen in book two. What do I know? So, as you can see, this is like a really, um, like, 80s, 90s, satanic panic level of, you know, horror, right? It's like fantastical shit that's not hap- not really happening. And, of course, there are terrible things ha- that happen in the world like these scenarios. But... To have them all in one book in one kid's family, and also in one, to just in one list, family to just at list this time them. of year <laughs> at this time of day, localized entirely within your family tree, localized entirely within the state of El Paso, Texas. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's you know, when you're not giving any weight or gravity to the events or to the people in them, it I don't understand why do it at all. Why write it out? It just doesn't doesn't have any impact. I don't think. Doesn't it mention in the about the author that he does shock art at some point? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's what he means. I think that this is his idea of shock art, which is just write stuff in there that makes you go, "My God, that's a shocking thing to think about." <sighs> I I don't see the point. It it doesn't doesn't work very immature idea of shock art right yeah. now not that i'm the one that seeks that kind of thing out so who am i to actually yeah, talk about I this guess... not even an art historian or anything like that either but to me if i want something to make me think on a deeper level besides that's a bad thing that shouldn't happen i'm gonna need more out of, <laughs> uh, out of a yeah, piece of art gonna... than just that thought for me to go like oh this was a good piece of art that made me have some feelings and thoughts besides, once again, that's a bad thing that shouldn't happen. Yeah. I, well, I guess, I don't know. Do you want to talk about what we think makes good 
um, challenging writing or good horror writing now instead of, and then we can save yes. the other stuff. Okay, so we're, we're going to jump. I, I guess these notes weren't super organized, but yeah, this book did get me thinking about, okay, clearly this style isn't for me. I don't think it's a great choice to just kind of have a running like gag list of like all like Satan had sex with a baby. Like, okay. Um, and I started thinking like, okay, well what does work for me? What horror do I like? And I started thinking about books and movies that I've seen that, um, that either I just enjoyed, um, you know, and, and weren't terribly challenging or ones that did challenge me. And I, and, you know, I was just thinking about like, all right, what happened? What made me like this? And for me, I think there's, there's three things that make horror writing effective um, I would also say that this also works in film. Like, there's three elements that make a horror film, I think, good. So, for both writing and film, I, I feel like these three things need to be present. So, for w- one, you need to understand something about the character's intentions, their motivations, or their feelings. You need some kind of emotional buy-in. You you gotta have a connection, whether it's to the bad guy or the good guy or to both of them. Um or to you got to there's got to be a reason you have to care right even in horrible horrible films that have like torture and you know abuse and whatever like there's you got to give a shit about something if you don't give a shit and you don't know anything about the people just hearing what happened or seeing it doesn't really doesn't do anything right cuz you have no you have no connection you have no reason to care Secondly, you got to show and not tell. I mean, this book is like a, the prime example of just telling and not showing. <laughs> it's like we've read other books like Perhaps this. Perhaps the author thinks that just describing these scenes out it, it is the way of showing instead of telling. But when you're dealing with text, I know it can feel like you're always telling because you're literally just writing words on a page. And that, that must be telling because there's words on the page <laughs> that you have to read. But – when it comes to text stuff like this, I think the showing and not telling aspect, sorry to interrupt you on this, but no, no, it's fine. is um, when you give me certain kinds of details that make me consider some sort of metaphorical dimension or new angle on why this is horrible beyond just sheer pain or, well, I wouldn't like my guts outside my body, right? And that's kind of ties back into the emotional buy-in uh, side of things where horror works if there's a dimension to it where you're like this is something that i care about that i don't want something horrible to happen to and something horrible might be happening to it yeah you're absolutely right for i feel like for horror to be successful you have to care and some of that care can be derived from yeah from doing good job showing like you want to show me why like you said it's obvious that torture and like chainsaws and abuse and assault are horrible because they're painful but <clears throat> that's such a i don't that's like you don't even have to say it you already know it so what can you tell me what new dimension can you add to make me care about this and make it interesting and and also the details like what details to focus on are important too this guy just kind of strung together a bunch of, you know, five-point vica- vocabulary words and thought that, you know, calling blood vital fluid was artistic or something. It's not the direction you want to go, man. It doesn't work. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and the third thing I think a good horror story needs is some kind of suspense or mystery. And that will give you a longer-term investment beyond a single scene, you know, in a book or film. <clears throat> so for me, when I'm thinking about books or films that had all these elements that I enjoyed. Um, I can cite, I can cite Hellraiser. Um, I, I mean, I saw the film before I read the book, like most people, but it's, you know, it's got all that stuff you in the film, which I, I guess I'll talk about because I think more people are familiar with it. Um, you come to know some of the main characters. You come to know a little bit about some of the villains. Um, and things are sort of unraveled to you slowly and you there is definitely a mystery because you're like what is going on with this little puzzle box why are people why is there flesh on hooks and then it's gone like you know you've you've got some investment in the mystery and i think the hellraiser also delves into you know the lines between pleasure and pain and how humans can get really wrapped up in 
searching for things that aren't there and trying to satisfy them, you know, looking for satisfaction in all the wrong places. <laughs> Um, and it takes it to an extreme. Uh, the film also has like really incredible practical effects. So, you know, if you haven't seen the original Hellraiser and you're into horror or you just, you know, like practical stuff. And that's it. where your medium counts, right? Yeah. Cause horror films, you want to see something visually that is horrible <laughs> because that's the medium you're working in and therefore you have an opportunity. So, um, if you're done with your Hellraiser spiel, I can also submit for, uh, consideration the thing, of course. Oh, the thing. Yeah. One of my faves. Uh, which, my faves. if you want to talk about dimensions of horror, there's a lot to this one because the main crux of that whole movie is the loss of trust in other people around you in a desperate situation, right? Like that's really, it's not just, oh my God, there's a horrible alien that's eating people and taking over their bodies. There's that element too, but there's also the group dynamic breaking down and all the mistrust. Like the scariest scene in that movie isn't necessarily when the dog's face opens up into millions of teeth. It's the one where- Spoilers the for test. the thing uh, <laughs> from 35 years ago. Sorry, Chris, continue. Yeah. But it's the blood test scene that everyone really loves, right? Yeah. And a blood test isn't scary on its own unless you're a little needle phobic like me sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the gravity of that situation being that, oh, my God, one of us might be an alien that is about to eat us adds that dimension and how you can't trust other people around you because they could, you know, betray you terribly by eating your face. Also, because it's a visual thing it's film the practical effects in the thing are some of my favorite oh, ever yeah, period it's, it's like the epitome of putting horrible things on screen to me is the thing so that's the other dimension that they added that sort of new frontier well it's funny you mentioned that because the thing also had you know also began as a short story a written work and mm -hmm. i've read it um i don't think the story is as impactful as the film because i just think this is i mean similar to hellraiser i think it's just it's just way cooler to see fucked up shit on screen <laughs> like it's it's often just well and, and when we say fucked up shit we're actually talking like monster designs yeah and things yeah like that right right so, so sometimes that stuff is just better conveyed visually because you can see a lot more in a few seconds than you can describe in in words oftentimes but um the sh thing short story still i mean still a good concept like they kept most of the same elements um Except the short story had a weird obsession with uh, with um, the main character in the film. It's McCready, um, played by is it Kurt Russell? Kurt, yep, yeah. Kurt Russell. Uh, in the book, he you know McCready's the main character, and I don't know. The author was just really obsessed with talking about how bronzed he was, very bronzed. <laughs> he used the verb bronzed or bronze. He's a literal statue man. Yeah, it was it was a little strange. That's why the thing couldn't get him because he was made of metal. <laughs> that's how he got away. But yeah, I do think I do actually think the the text of the thing is not that fantastic, but it's a good short story. Um, so I think it works because it's short and concise and tight and like keeps the action going. And the film is the same way. Like you barely know time is passing in that movie. Cause it's just so tense the whole time. You're like so concerned about what's going to happen in the next few seconds. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And I mean, sorry, I know we're doing a lot of talking about films here. Um, I was going to bring up martyrs, uh, the French film as a horror movie that, I had a real hard time with like I actually got mad and was like why am I watching this and like wanted to quit because before the final five minutes of the movie you have no idea why any of this is ha anything in the movie is happening there's no fucking way you could piece it together and you're just like this is I was just so mad. I was like, this is so fucking stupid. What is this? Just torture porn? Like, I don't want to watch these people be beat up or whatever. I won't give it away because <clears throat> I think it's it's uh if you're into horror movies and deep psychological stuff, it's worth seeing. It's a hard watch for sure. Uh it's not not easy to watch. So if you're squeamish, don't fucking watch martyrs. Um <clears throat> but the end of the film, those last five minutes changed my mind completely i was like oh <laughs> okay i get it now um so even though it's a really difficult watch and you do have to watch a lot of like physical abuse and murder and stuff the end of it i think really sells it and it's uh it's a it's one of the most challenging films i've ever seen um and again, this is the French Martyrs. This is the original. I have not seen the American remake, and I'm guessing it is not going to be 
as good. Um, just based on my experience as being an American, I would guess that our versions of anything, not good. Um, so yeah, I mean, sometimes you can present really graphic, violent content and you can come to, a a meaning or a point in the end that makes it worthwhile. I guess this is the only point I, this is what I'm trying to say. Uh, this book does none of that. There is no point to anything in this book other than, hey, have you thought about this gross thing? Like, yeah, man, whatever, you know. And I, you know, it's kind of harder for me to appreciate textual horror a lot of the time. I guess the way I interact with it the most is death metal lyrics. Mm. Um, I don't read a lot of horror stories or horror, like, scary books. Most of the horror stuff is I've read has been on this podcast, so that's kind of taints my idea of like what good horror fiction can be i don't know why i just i'm not drawn to that as much as the death metal lyric side of things which is interesting to me because in death metal lyrics it's not like you have the time to really get that deep about it usually but for me i appreciate violent lyrics when they're being used to make some kind of other point you could cite the classic cattle decapitation example where they use some kind of gory imagery to convey how they're you know they're Probably some of the most famously vegan mm -hmm. band out there, maybe. <laughs> yeah, Cattle Decapitation and um, uh, Earth Crisis. Uh, I mean, that's that's hardcore punk. That's not heavy metal. But in terms of using visceral lyrics, visceral gory lyrics to like talk about animal rights <laughs> and veganism, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I was going to say, uh, uh, and other metal bands that I listen to that have violent imagery in them. I'm a Black Dahlia Murder fan. That's not that deep either. It's usually just talking about haunted castles and curses and Satan shit all the time. That's fine. So that's not exactly deep, but I think the reason I might like it in death metal lyrics is because to me, I find death metal to be tongue in cheek on purpose. And I feel like people that take it very seriously are weird yeah, to me. Yeah, I agree. And death metal is like kind of an over the top not a cloud show but in some ways yes it's like a circus act in 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 oh, some fashion and that's why i can yeah. appreciate absolutely yeah you're you're not wrong um i think well i think i have a couple of thoughts on this one is i think it's very difficult to compare song lyrics to a book or even a film because well, I agree. Let, let's say with a book. It's a different medium, it's, but I'm yeah. just questioning why I'm drawn to well, it in music versus not in text. Oh, yeah. Well, because, I mean, in music, the, the actual music is the primary element. Oftentimes, you can't even make out the words to harsh vocals. I mean, some, some performers have better enunciation than others. And obviously, if you're like us and you've been listening to it for, you know, 30 years, then you, you become pretty good at parsing it out. But largely you're you like the s sounds the music makes you're not sitting here going oh my god did you hear what corpse grinder said like corpse grinder fisher like <laughs> oh my god the latest song about like cutting open a woman's breast was so good like no one is sitting here talking about <laughs> did how you read nurgle's latest blog post about <laughs> satan yeah like no one is sitting here going like oh yeah those like harsh lyric vocals i mean once in a while you get a band that really writes some some great uh, great lyrical poetry. It happens. Uh, but for the vast majority of the time, the music is the main event and the lyrics are just kind of there. Uh, I mean, and this, I, I mean, I could just open Metal Archives right now <laughs> if we, if we want to go that route. Um, are you looking for particularly inspired lyrics that you like? No, I was just going to look up something like that people that's like really popular just to prove my point of like, Okay, this is like a really notable band and like listen to how silly their um their lyrics are. So hang on, let me I have an idea. Let me just pull this up. Oh, this is great. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, we're going to I'm just going to read uh, a little bit of Mayhem's Death Crush. Um if you want to talk about like gory or violent imagery, I guess that that covers one. Um here's the lyrics of Death Crush. Demonic laughter, your cremation. Your lungs gasp for air but are filled with blood. A sudden crack as I crush your skull. The remind of your life flashes by. A life that soon won't be. Smiling with axe in my hand. Evil's rotten hand, you'll see. I come forward. Death crush. I'll send you to your maker. I'll send you to your death. Death nicely crucified. Death, heads on stakes. The barbecue has just begun. <laughs> death crush, death crush, death crush. Crush, crush. 
death crush, death crush, death crush. <laughs> Sorry. Listen, I actually I'm love, trying to get a point across I here. actually love that song, um, but yeah, the lyrics are, are pretty silly. Um, I mean, and then the next song on that record is Chainsaw Guts Fuck. So, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a time. I will say when you're like listening to that or any other you know death metal sure if you get really into it you you tend to figure out the lyrics and maybe you find some you like but it's just not the same thing like no one is publishing books of death metal lyrics and saying like read this as a story you know (laughs) it's like true inherently comparing two things that aren't super related i mean plus the the let's talk about the lyricism in this book right like just the art the way language is used um is awful i i like it's i guess i guess we can move into talking about um all of the language stuff Uh uh-huh we usually talk about this first but i think now we're going to talk about editing structure word choices this shit needs some serious editing i don't think anyone touched this if it was edited by anyone we did with our hands and now yeah if this was edited by anyone they should be ashamed of themselves because it was just i mean all right we've talked about no paris they shouldn't just be ashamed they should stub their toe forever and ever and then the toe falls off and it comes alive and it jumps down their throat and it chokes them to death and then their corpse is left behind to be cleaned up by their little brother who then has to <laughs> bury the corpse outside in the yard but then someone walks by and says hey you're a murderer and kicks the kid in the chest and then that person gets poisoned by I- <laughs> that's, yeah that's it's about the pace we were we were experiencing in this book um i all right like my oh my god my sweet satan the word choices in this book i this, so this is another thing that made me feel like it was so similar to splattering yet endearing because There were just word choices and sentence structures that blew my mind. They were terrible. (laughs) I mean, we've talked about thesaurus abuse on this show. This is third degree thesaurus homicide. That that thesaurus was gunned down with malice. Yeah, he (laughs) he ripped the thesaurus' intestines out. And in the entrails of the thesaurus, he spelled out another word for thesaurus (laughs) in the guts. (laughs) What is why doesn't a thesaurus have another word for itself? That would be the best thesaurus. Uh I'm sure there's another word for a thesaurus. We just are used to thesaurus because Write in your alternate words for thesaurus. I mean alternate word book. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Done. That's what this guy would have called it if he brought up a thesaurus in this book. Alright, so just off the top, we've got he can't even say that he was just like outside on the porch. He had to say ligneous porch because ligneous is an obscure word for wooden. Uh, grody optics. Ligneous these nuts. <laughs> ah! <laughs> All right, you got me there. Grody optics are gross eyes. And then oh, the word use of grody there honestly offends me <laughs> because you only like unless you're specifically trying to bring up the vibe of California surfer guy, that word doesn't help your case here. There, words have associations, right? And using grody there just makes me think of, again, California surfer guys. Maybe that's just me. No, it, yeah, it's really weird. A friable lap. Which he was just trying to say that someone had someone was frail. Oh, I thought he was talking about a battered. Lap uh, yeah, had, I mean, it, were, it is now a friable. Lap. Who knows? What does friable mean? Frail, like you know. Oh. Yeah. I see. But it's not. But they, they, shouldn't it be frailable then? Why do they switch up the idea? <laughs> frailable. <laughs> anyway, the point point being is, it's clear that he's reaching for the most unused words to pull into his book. To try to sound smarter. Dusty ass words. Out yeah, of here, which dude. is, I mean, and this is also, this is like similar to what we talked about in The Long Moonlight. Although, to be clear, The Long Moonlight was, is far and away not, not near this book, but it suffered from a similar, like, I'm going to use, you know, I'm going to use special fancy words and sound real smart. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to 
read some passages to you, just so you all understand what we're talking about here. I informed my grandmother about these dreams and my difficulty sleeping, and after discussing it over with my grandfather, she decided to take me to see a trained doctor who majored in dream interpretation. Can you major in dream interpretation? That's, that's a question. <laughs> I, I didn't John even, Market on that's a real slip. I gotta be honest I didn't with even, you. I didn't even catch that in the first read. Okay. Um. <laughs> what Ooh. college, what non-accredited <laughs> school granted that major? The beginning of my treatment went well. I began to adjust to the doctor and disclose to him the subject matter of my dreams and explain to him the situation of my late Wait parents. a minute. This is the fake doc. Wait a minute. Isn't this the fake yeah, doctor? Yeah, hang on. He's hang on. I, maybe your first clue should have been the, the, the major in dream interpretation. Yeah, it should have been. He seemed as though he were a genial elderly man, a confiding person full of sympathy and loyalty. And the more I discussed with him, I began to grow fond of his neighborly attitude. I addressed him by his Arabic name, Dr. Balas Muhammad, although he insisted that I address him by just Balas. What do you mean his Arab? That's just his fucking name, dude. That's just his name. <laughs> what do you mean his Arabic name? Get out of here. It appeared that I hovered over him, being that he must have been only about five feet or so, and he had an ashen, protracted beard that hung from his face halfway down to his chest. He had caligonous skin, and though he may have been in his 60s, uh -oh. he had very few wrinkles. He wore thin white glasses and spoke with a strong accent, making it bothersome to understand some of his words at times. Ballas prescribed me medicine to help me cope with my phantoms as well as my frame of mind and overall mood. Although they caused me to be more somnolent, the pills he gave me seemed to work, and over time, my dreams settled down and became less unhallowed. I no longer felt unease going to sleep, and my grandparents felt at peace knowing that I had found peace. Once the doctor and I commenced seeing each other on more friendly terms, I can say he started showing me a side of him that I greatly did not appreciate. Ballas began making sexual remarks toward my grandmother, oftentimes outwardly flirting with her. He would palpate my grandmother inappropriately, even going as far as to gape at her backside, seeming as though he had forgotten his surrounds. I expressed my discomfort with this, in which Ballas responded as being ostensibly embarrassed, claiming that he had meant nothing by it. I saw a decrease in his deportment for weeks at a time before Ballas invited my grandmother to go dining with him. My grandmother seemed astounded at first, and then went on to tell him that she is happily married to my grandfather. Ballas told her that it was nothing romantic, just a harmless night out, and he suggested that she ask her husband to see if it would be acceptable. My grandfather does not mind my grandmother going out with this man, as he has never been the controlling type, and in fact he wished her a good night and told her to enjoy herself. I mean, it's just, like, the sentence construction and the vocabulary choices in this baffling so something to know is that the author did start writing this when he was 15 right mm -hmm. i think he published it when he was like 18 or something is that correct 18 or 19 something like that I I, yeah i think i think it was i think maybe when he was 18 and so my thought is like, okay, look, like children are not inherently good authors, right? Like just by their youth and experience, they're going to write things that are kind of garbage sometimes. Some kids can, you know, some people have published young and it's been fine, but I think it's pretty normal to start writing something young and look at it a couple years later and go, oh boy, I got to redo that. No, this guy looked at it a few years later and said, I'm going to publish that just as it is. <laughs> like, I, so... I know if we've talked to anything that I ever wrote creatively as a 15 year old was ever let out of the fucking hopefully bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the dump that it has ended up in somewhere or hopefully like the paper recycled into a more useful form. I like I would be glad if that never, ever, ever happened. <laughs> I also cannot imagine anything I did at that age being uh, published. I mean, I. <laughs> We've talked about this before where we were like wary of reviewing books by young people. But to me, I mean, first of all, I had no idea this person was younger when we got the book. I only realized that later. But the fact that they, at 18, published it and then a few years later, a little older, published the second half <laughs> tells me that there was there yeah. was bad judgment here and that it didn't. I don't know that it really mattered, right? I feel like the quality of the writing probably continued to be poor, even despite, you know, age. Uh, it, I don't know. I'm just going to pick some other random spots to read. Just, you know, enjoy this journey with us. 
As time progressed, I became mentally drained as though a vacuum cleaner had imbibed all the exertion out of my brain and left nothing but an arid, forsaken gash. I became lethargic in my body language, repining with every step I managed to make and compelling my hands to abide as I went to reach for a necessity. I lost complete interest in my physical appearance, something that is profusely anomalous of my character. Atop of my mental woes, my dreams began getting out of hand, eventually dominating my sleep as I advanced into something distressingly disordered and concerningly realistic. I just thought that was a did pretty we... good microcosm of... <laughs> Wait, did he say compelled his hands to abide yeah. when reaching yeah. for a necessity? Yep, yep. That that's seems it. like a really overwrought way to say I had muscle problems or like, you know... Or I just didn't feel like doing stuff. Like, you can just say it, dude. You don't... <laughs> Not that we want you to write it that way either as, you know, as blithely as we're putting it here, but I don't know. I feel like sometimes people use wordier words to try to get it to seem smarter when like i said before words have associations right yeah so the more artful way to go about that if you don't want to just say i had trouble reaching for things or i would i didn't feel good enough to actually do basic stuff there's a more artful associate set of associations that you could be making with your word choice like how depressed are you really is it like you know, all the lights went out in your soul. or so. That's a really terrible yeah, fucking metaphor bad. right there. But that's what you get when you come up, you know, think for only five seconds live on a podcast. <laughs> and, you know, don't sit down and try to come up with something, which is what you probably should be spending your time on doing if you're a writer. Yeah, I mean, and the other thing, too, is that we I think we've we've talked about this in actually several episodes this year. When writers think adding words is going to help, it actually just adds more barriers and makes your makes your ideas more confusing which is the opposite of what you want to do so sometimes adding words is not always the good choice actually i would say most of the time it's not the right choice um i think keeping things concise and poignant is is the way to go and just saying like oh i'm gonna find every synonym for a wooden porch and use it in this book like why how does that help how does that improve anything if your reader has to wonder what the fuck does ligneous mean i I just think that's a failure on your part. Unless unless it was relevant, unless it was like a piece of an academic paper and for some reason they had to use ligneous instead of wooden, which I can't imagine. I can't really imagine a scenario where that would be the case, but um, there's no sense in renaming everything. <laughs> if you're putting a word in and the thought you're having as you put a word in is like, man, that'll make people think I'm smart reconsider using the word yeah, yes good point um so similar like you know a similar like a twin problem to this is overly labored descriptions so he'll sometimes describe the same thing three or four ways and why it describe the thing once sometimes and he well says the same description three times in a row too there was like that intestine part i'm pretty sure he talked about the grandma's intestines being out the same mm -hmm. way three times in a row as well uh this is an example of that um ah uh this is right at the beginning his pupils froze for an abrupt second and slowly found their way facing me his eyes reminded me of the sight of an unattended, gruesomely infected wound, yellow and dripping in water-like pus, and the preternatural colorant of his grody optics made him look as if he had been suffering from a terminal disease. His pupils looked as cadaverous as him, bloodless and clear in pigment, although the way he stared made them sometimes appear as atramentous as night. He had dark swollen bags depressingly glued underneath wow, his eyes. Wow, you're so smart! Oh, wow. Which made his physical appearance even more unappealing. So we have a whole paragraph on this guy's eyes, but I don't, I think he could have said that in a sentence if he really wanted to focus on how creepy his eyes were. Um, yeah, at, I mean, Atramentus is like a band name. So for me, that was just funny. So I was like, okay. We are Atramentus. <laughs> I mean, it, it, no. This is Grody Optics. One, two, three, four. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, they're like a Death Doom band. So it would be like... <laughs> Uh, tremendous. I don't know. Yeah, because you have tremendous right in there, and usually big in invites the idea of like slower riffs, right? Sure. So that's why it would be a do. That's like that is a good do band name. <laughs> Just the wrong focus everywhere. Everywhere you look, the focus <laughs> is wrong. Like I, I don't know how else to say this. He just keeps. 
describing things like we talks about a stripe on that same guy's sock. Yeah, he wore a long You're sleeve shirt. You're talking about pus eyes. He wore a long <laughs> sleeve shirt, like... long sweatpants, and short gray socks with a black strip across the middle. Why do I fucking care? I don't care what prison clothes the serial killer is wearing. I don't care about the stripe on the sock. You could Why? just say he was in the prison clothes, right? And that gets the idea of that this is an incarcerated person across shore. But the stripe on the sock is a totally right. unnecessary detail Actually, that adds I'll, nothing I'll throw to... this book a tiny little fucking squirrel bone. Um, there is, right before that, he says his clothes, the serial killer's clothes, were the same color as the walls and furniture, beige and dull. And, like, if you had done that more artfully, that could have helped to get across the point that, you know being in this mental institution or whatever had kind of taken the joy out of things and kind of ma tries to make everything the same where the prison clothing and the walls are the same color. Like if that had been done in an artful way, that's a better path to go down than spending a paragraph trying to tell me how creepy his eyes are and then tell me about his socks. Like I just, just what are you doing? What is happening? I, yeah. So I don't, I, I don't know. But then the socks were smelly because they had didn't even get out of the dryer soon enough yesterday, which means that the smelly feet were so smelly that they killed the person in the in the jail cell next door, and that person had to get picked up by the same corpse shoveling kid from the last time I did this <laughs> bit, and he also <laughs> failed to be the okay. I'm All right, I'm going to read one last section and then we can talk about the rest of the stuff and close up. How about that? As I struggled to identify the cryptic obstacles that guarded my path, I crept onto the ground of the gelid confined sewer. Gelid? Is it gelid confined sewer or gelid? Gelled. It's gelid? just a very gelid? sticky, mm. perhaps fruit flavored <laughs> pathway. I crept onto the ground of the jello sewer, um, where, where I eventually came across a dim, effulgent glow that gave me just enough lucent needed for. <laughs> All right, man, now you're renaming light. Get out of here. Like. Just enough lucent needed for me to examine my surroundings. The closer I managed to crawl and approach the lustrous beam, I believed my exhausted psyche began throwing daunting images into my head as a cautioning for me to retreat, but my stale stubbornness and refusal to be demoted wouldn't accord me the ability to turn you away. You can't demote me. I quit <laughs> this jello sewer. God, this reads like a fucking... This reads like... Someone's some like one of Trump's lawyers submitting a brief and just like trying to keep it long and use a bunch of words and just to, you know, trick the judge. As I confronted the stomach of the sewer, I found that the light that had been leading me through the conduit had been no more than a small lantern that, instead of a bulb, held a blazing ember. As cold as the inside of the sewer had been, the fire contrarily continued to burn. It be fire can be yeah. it's fine in cold air. <laughs> yeah, what? Fire, be... That's why you make a fire when it's cold. Yeah, it being cold does not mean that there won't be fire. Uh, all right. <laughs> Beside it, I saw what appeared to be a naked, derelict man who had seized the flesh off my grandfather's torso and placed the strips around his shoulders in an attempt to I wear it as a jacket. For a person. It's not like a ship. Someone who opened a thesaurus and put their finger on a word and said, good enough. Um... He wrapped my grandfather's vitiated skin around his body and arms. That's not even the right use of vitiated. Uh, and he seemed to be oblivious to the blood leaking off it. The way the blood dripped and released itself from the skin made it look like a mildewy Italian <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that one. I did too. <laughs> Pasta's terrible. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the corpse skin. Oh, jeez. Oh, I really boned this one up. I, you know, <laughs> of all the comparisons to make, I'm really not thinking like lasagna and flesh as looking <laughs> the same. I don't know. I could see the skeleton of my grandfather's. You haven't been to this horrible Italian <laughs> restaurant, the Olive Garden. <laughs> the Unalive Garden. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Come on out to our ligneous back deck where you can enjoy unlimited flesh lasagna. Uh, and imbibe all of the <laughs> alcoholic liquid remnants you can you can desire. <laughs> anyway, um I could see the skeleton of my grandfather's demolished torso, which he had positioned next to him, splayed and flattened like a rug on a living room floor or a shower curtain in one's bathroom. Who is spreading their shower curtain on the floor? 
No, I, I, or the shower curtain in the bathroom. Come on. <laughs> flattened. Flattened? Like a shower curtain on in your bathroom? No, the flattened was for the rug on the in the living room previously. The aura shower curtain is a separate thought entirely that is connected, yes, to flattened <laughs> because of the or in there. But in the author's mind, that was a completely separate clause. It's a poorly constructed clause. Continuing. Yes. <laughs> the skeleton still had some skin plastered on it, and the majority of the ribs had been sundered. As I reached the furthest I would allow my body to attain, I realized that I had been in the presence of a deceased man, and by his appearance, his body had been constrained in the darkness of the sewer for more than a few nights. I stared at his rimy body, not knowing how to react and anticipating for some form of miracle to evacuate me from this repugnant circumstance. His skin had become the color of a glacier. I could see that he had fractured his left foot, causing it to position itself backward and making the bone poke through the ripped skin. Perhaps this injury had contributed to his death. Are we talking about his grandfather's corpse or the, or the skin wearer guy? I think we're talking about skin wearer guy. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm also at this point confused. Yeah, that's what I mean. I, I really lost track there. I started to query what I should do, if anything at all, and suddenly the entrance to the sewer flung shut, extending the dimness of the sewer and causing it to look like the inside of a cave. Just at that moment, I heard a slight croon coming from the eyes of the man. That he the, heard a slight <laughs> Okay. Listening to the tune, I could ascertain that the humming derived from an aged nursery rhyme. Terrified, I turned the opposite direction and looked for an available trail to guide my way out. Then I heard trivial scuffling. I simulated that it must have been a rodent or some other minuscule creature, and I maintained my task on seeking an exit route. The straggling noise continued, and it sounded like chalk being stabbed on an old blackboard in a quiet room. I looked back, and a small opening in the ceiling revealed that the wind had been blowing a folded piece of paper that laid rested in the man's hand. Being nigh enough to observe, I saw that the paper disclosed information to my grandfather's bank account. End of chapter. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Wait, so the dead guy that was wearing the skin mm -hmm. got the bank account info from the corpse? But then he died anyway in a sewer, and I guess nursery wait, rhymes no, came hey, out of his wait, eyes. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> the corpse? The corpse had a bank account info on it? The corpse, the mutilated corpse. The corpse had his grandfather's bank account info, and also was wearing his grandfather's skin for reasons. Okay, but where did the where did the skin wearer corpse get the bank account info? Ostensibly from the grandfather's corpse that is also in the room yes. at the same time. Yeah. So his grandfather was walking around with just his bank account info on him at all times. Yeah, why not? I mean, we got nursery rhymes coming out of <laughs> eyes here, Chris. There is there's no grasp of reality. We are untethered, floating free through space, through El Paso, Texas, the state of... <laughs> Okay, I think we've made our point <laughs> Yeah, here. I don't think you need to hear any of the rest of this. I guess if you want to, I will happily record some sections of me reading this, but for now... I won't. For now. For the sake of this episode. Um, so, we okay, so we've obviously joked several times about the state of El Paso, Texas, because it's just funny as a joke, as a mistake. But, so at first, I was like, all right, this kid is getting his degree in psychology. So I'm thinking... Okay, he must be getting his, like, PhD or something. Then I realize he's an undergrad. Then I realize it's community college. And I'm like, what <laughs> asylum is like, yes, you can interview this famed dangerous serial killer, 19-year-old going to community college. I just, to me, that seems highly unlikely. Maybe I'm wrong. But I don't think you can just, as a kid, as a 19-year-old kid, just be like, yeah, I'd, uh, I'd like to interview uh, Ted Bundy for school. Like, I don't think that's a thing. That's grad school level stuff minimally, right? Like, you got to be at least putting down, like, 100 k in debt. To... Well, I don't even know if, as a student, you're just allowed to, to do that. Probably not. Yeah. But if you, if you were, it would probably be grad school level research, or right? Or I would say even a doctorate level. Like, I, I'm not sure what the—I mean, and I, I imagine the rules are different between states because this country is a joke um but yeah i don't know it it just it, it um it initially hits me as ridiculous but i could be wrong i don't really know what I, I know nothing about interviewing people in prison so who knows struck me as weird 
Yeah, I don't know. Did we have anything else? I mean, I don't, besides just how even for someone that listens to death metal, I found this to be it like you said at the top, it's very it comes across very silly, mm-hmm. but then by the time you're getting into the necropedo stuff at the end, I was just like, All right, man, come on. Like like it, you're just doing this to make me go, Wow, that's such a fucked up thing that you can now have to think about. I just got tired of it by the end. Yeah, it really it's really just exhausting and it wears you down. It's not enter- it's not fun entertainment, it's not scary entertainment, it's not informative. I don't get the point of it. Um and yeah, the the super necropedo stuff at the end is just I don't know, and, and it made me think that it made me start thinking, you know, why would someone think this is good? <laughs> I honestly don't know. I think it's just somebody who doesn't have enough life experience, right? Whether whether it's because they're because of their age or just because they haven't like gotten out enough or like experienced enough of the world yet to understand that hey, you know, maybe this isn't the best way to treat these things cuz a lot of the stuff in this book is like I mean, some of it's like cartoonish villain stuff, but some of it actually is serious thing stuff like little girls getting kidnapped and and sexually abused and like videotaped and stuff and that's a that's actually a bigger problem than i think a lot of people think it is <laughs> um and it, it i think the worst thing about this book other than the experience of reading it and having to like string these sentences together in my mind um was just that it it doesn't give there's no gravitas there's no there's nothing it it just trivializes these real serious horrors for what? Like, it's not funny. As a way to make you go, to, to make the reader go like, oh, terrible. Like, so what is that adding Yeah. To, to my experience here to make me go like, oh, wow, that's such a terrible thing. Like, the world is terrible. I can open the news and read a similar story and be like, wow, that's terrible. I, what is, yeah, what is the point? What does this book give to the world? Nothing. It took things from me. This book set my hair on fire. I should mention that. <laughs> I was waiting that's, for you to bring this up. That is something uh, that's bad about this book. So... The arm of Satan reaching through. Yeah, Satan and I are cool, man. It wasn't Satan. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just true. talked that's to him right. the other day. He's fine. Um, so we're on the. Po- I'm really busy. Like it, it's like it's actually so bad up there that um, I have to like keep track of all the. They don't tell you that, but I actually have to keep track of all the bad stuff. I have to account for it. So actually, more bad is more work. For me. This didn't help. Yeah, I mean, Satan and I are working on migrating his database um, to a bigger one so we can <laughs> keep track. Of all the shit going My on. My Satan QL <laughs> database. Yeah, you didn't know that's what it stood for. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, I was so, uh, when the weather is nice, as it has been now in spring, um, I, well, I guess when you're hearing this, it's going to be like fall um, <laughs> or, or summer. But uh, when we're... Tipping them off to how far ahead we've been recording. Yeah, when, when we're recording this, it's spring in New England. So the weather's nice. Whenever it's like 65 or higher, I love to just be on the porch. I will work on the porch. I will read on the porch. I will take my meals on the porch. I love being outside. I just love it. You like to have your ligneous desk outside to work <clears throat> near. Well, my, my ligneous desk on my ligneous porch um, yes. aloft amidst the <laughs> spiny ligneous twigs and fingers of the tree. Anyway, um, so... One day I had to work kind of late and then I had to do some TBC stuff. So I was just out on the porch all day. And as it started to get dark, I brought a candle outside. Um, and actually it was a pretty narrow neck. So I wasn't worried about anything getting in there. But as I was leaving the porch, um, my I have... All right. I don't know what this was called. I have like only one trip syndrome. Do you have the syndrome too, Chris? You have this disease as well? Yeah. I also have the sort of the splintering of the disease where (laughs) if I'm holding something in my hand and I have to like do another task that requires me to do something else, Mm -hmm. I will keep the thing held in my hand and attempt to do the other task with one hand when I could just put the other thing down and do the task with two hands and it would be way easier. (laughs) Yeah, I have the same disease. I have the full spectrum of the disorder. Like, (laughs) <laughs> so I was coming in from the porch because it started to get colder. It was like it was like almost nine o'clock. So the sun had been down for a while, and I was like, "All right, time to go in." So my laptop under my arm. I got my phone, my headphones. I got the candle, the book, 
and I'm like, I'm gonna do all this in one trip. And like, <laughs> look, look at me. Be so proud of me, everyone. Yeah, no one can see me, and if they could, they would be concerned <laughs> and not excited. And so, um, I should mention, I don't think I had any pockets because women's clothing is terrible. So I was like tucking things under my arms, like book and laptop and like phone probably, and then I had oh, I had a drink and the candle, I think. So. I managed to open the porch door, get into the vestibule, and then I realized that the door into the house is fully closed. And so I'm like, oh, I got to put something down. So I go to put the candle down on the floor, and as I lean to the floor to put the candle down, my hair goes right into the neck of the candle. <laughs> and, uh, and by the way, this was after I dropped the book on the floor. And my hair went up in flames, and luckily I was able to quickly snuff it, and I actually don't think I really lost anything. I checked pretty thoroughly, and I was like, oh, maybe I just got some ends or something, but it's fine. I'm due for a trim. Thanks. Um, So I came in, and I was like, I already hate this book because I started reading it, and it caused me to set my hair on fire. I mean, I caused my hair to It should have fire, spiraled but... out from there where, like, you lit your hair on fire, and then you dropped all the stuff, and the glass from your candle and drink went into your skin and caused you to have to get surgery. Also, then I the fell house down the went stairs. on fire from your yeah. hair, and also you burned alive. But then after that, you were still alive and feeling all the pain from all of that. Uh-huh. And then your intestines fell out and spelled <laughs> the name of your former dog. <laughs> yes, correct. Um, anyway, uh, I actually, I think I might, I think I might actually set this book on fire. It might happen. First in TBC history. I don't think we've ever actually destroyed one. Well, we so rarely have physical, well, not rarely, but I think largely we do a lot of electronic books, but it's also pretty small. So I feel like burning it wouldn't be terrible but no one it's a rarity i had to ship this one from france paris yeah this this book was like it got it had a delivery date of like three months from when i ordered it i was like oh okay i guess i'll see that never (laughs) and then it shows up in my mailbox like three weeks later and it's from france which i did not know why that happened i yeah and the weird thing is like um it says it was printed in february 2019 so it looks like a print on demand thing by Rotomail Italia SPA Vignate MI Italy. So I'm guessing that's a print on demand in Italy. But why did someone in Italy or France want this printed? Why did they buy this? I have so many questions. All right. So, Chris, can we can we fix it? Uh, I mean, if you're trying to do shock art stuff, this is a real immature idea of shock art. I really don't, like. as we said before, I don't think there's a need for this here. So if you want to talk about these topics, perhaps think consider, consider the things that Paris mentioned before about what makes good horror, not that we're the arbiters of that, but you know, perhaps use that as a framework to give me reasons to care about why terrible things are happening or... Like, just add something else in here for me to think about or care about aside from thing bad, right? (laughs) Yeah, I don't... I don't think this can be fixed. This is, like, a full do-over situation. And I've been arguing with myself for the last couple days over whether this is worse than splattering it endearing. I think it's just... I think they're just tied. I think somehow this year we have two books tied for worst book. I definitely don't ever want to read either no. ever again. And I mean, there, there's just no reason this should have been published. I mean, I, I hope the author has learned from this experience and is either no longer writing or did some kind of intensive studies to get to become a better writer. However, I'm skeptical of that, um, seeing as they published the second part of this, which isn't a great sign because that means they must have stuck with it, uh, which I just don't. I don't get it. I I don't understand. Um, You know, and it's not like Chris and I can't imagine a world in which other people have different taste. But again, even if your taste is in horror and like, I like horror books and films and Chris, Chris likes a lot of horror video games. And it's like, I just don't think this is the way to treat this stuff. Even if you are going for creepy, scary, terrifying, gruesome, gory, This is the wrong approach entirely. I agree. So no, I just, I just hope this author has 
done something else with their time or has invested a lot of time into developing their writing. And I hope I hope they are beyond this at this point. Shall we uh All right, we thank patrons? Yes, thank you, patrons, because with your help we get to do stuff like this with our time. <laughs> Thank you, Greg, Veronica, Will, D, Jared, Arant, Senior, Jakub, Lycoris, Elliot, Kieran, Martin, Jay, Luchek, Miri, Yanka, David, Julius, Anya, Patricia, Austin, Donnie, Beast with the Least, Scott H, Robin, Laxdotes, Of the Void, the Taco Eating Unicorn. Also, your face is what he will eat. <laughs> Last Man on Earth 01. Funny Robot with Antennas, Hobby Boy 93, Harry, Mason, Renee, Emmy, The Ugly One, Bleached Black Cat. Julius the Nice Dragon, Eastern Swiss, Rudy Bo Booty, and our Kofi donor Kiwi thing. Thanks so much for supporting the show. Yes, and special thanks to uh, Reddit user Liard Bell. Li- Liard Bell? Not really sure how to say. <laughs> Lidyard Bell. Not really how to say your name. Lidyard Bell. <laughs> Not sure how to say your name, but I uh, appreciate we had a quick back and forth on Reddit, and uh, I just really appreciate that you posted about this author um trying to burn your house down i'm really glad that he didn't burn your house down i'm glad you're safe and fine <laughs> um, and i yes. i wish you many a positive book review experience in the future <laughs> with not with no authors trying to burn your house down <laughs> yeah please all right paris i'm gonna turn off my computer and then it'll explode <laughs> and then the shards will go in my eyes and then i'll get an eye infection i'll be even blinder <laughs> than i was before and then trip all over my headphone cables and then my face will go into the wall or my head will go into the next door apartment where I'll see that all along there was just corpses in there the whole time. And then ah. and then they're all having sex with skeleton cats and then Satan comes by. I don't know. Ugh, yeah. All right. Well, I hope the opposite of that happens for you, everybody. <laughs> see you later. All right. Goodbye. See you all in two weeks. Thank you for listening to another episode of Terrible Book Club. Terrible Book Club is an independent podcast produced by your hosts, Paris and Chris. Sound design and audio editing by Chris, with sound effects and music by Epidemic Sound and sometimes also Chris. Our theme song is Kiss by Yearn, which is, you guessed it, actually, also Chris. You can find more of his soothing synthy sounds on Bandcamp at yearn.bandcamp.com. Do you want us to review a book of your choice on the show? Do you want access to some extra audiovisual weirdness? If so, become a patron at patreon.com slash terriblebookclub. If you'd like to send us a one-time tip instead, you can do that at ko-fi.com slash terriblebookclub. You can also support TBC for free by sharing the show on social media, following our accounts on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or Goodreads, telling your friends about your favorite episode, or by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or anywhere else on the internet. To send us book recommendations or your adorable pet photos, send an email to terriblebookclub at gmail.com. Um, there, I remember there was a part where he was talking about his, like, brain being vacuumed or something and i was like "Ooh, this is a good oh one. cool <laughs> everyone likes a good brain vac I, you know it's honestly i do wish i could get my brain vacuumed. <laughs> yeah i need a good imagine that you could just suck these books out of your brain after we've read them oh that would be oh we just need a, a spotless mind or whatever sunshine mind spots whatever that's called eternal sunshine of the spotless nah, mind they should have they should have they should have called that movie eternal brain suck of the brain vacuum <laughs> that would have been a much greater title i think the time when i had my brain sucked off by, <laughs> by whoever i mean that's just the movie alien wrote that movie that's just alien <laughs>